as more and more people become interested in longevity, you're gonna have more and more longevity claims popping up. So this video is gonna outline the most bogus longevity claims. And I don't mean just these extreme things, I mean very real things that very real, honest, genuine people fall for because the science seems like it's strong. And it may not be completely phony, but it's weak science. So these are weak science offenders when it comes down to longevity. The number one offender is going to be stem cell treatment for longevity. Don't tune out if you're a stem cell fan. I think there is some promising data for stem cells in different categories, like for bones, for spine, for injuries, things like that. But when you get into the longevity world, you're looking at what are called hematopoietic stem cells, and these are like essentially blood stem cells. The research in humans is quite weak. Now, does that mean you shouldn't go do it? Candidly, I wouldn't. It's expensive, it's kind of risky, and the science just isn't there. Now, the rodent model research isn't half bad. Okay, they have found that when they transplant these hematopoietic stem cells, they do see an increase in lifespan with these rodents, but they typically see them in immunocompromised rodents. And you have to remember that although I do like rodent model studies for getting us kickstarted into research, I also find that when you're talking about things like this, it's misleading because these are living in hermetically sealed environments where longevity is not a normal thing to consider. Like they don't have outside influence and outside disease risk. So the human data is just not strong. It's simply not. Now there was a study that was published in Bioinformant that found that in animal models, they did see a 10 to 15 percent increase in lifespan, but the study even mentions itself that there is not any known human benefit to this. This wouldn't be a concern if this was like a $9 supplement that you were potentially taking and it wasn't bothering you and it was no sweat off your back. But when you're talking something that's 10, 15, 20, 30, $50,000 that's making bogus claims, I think it's really important to look at that data. This next one is probably the biggest offender that hits the mainstream. And that's the fact that a low protein diet is what you need for longevity. This isn't just a little bit wrong. In my humble opinion, it's scary that we potentially are telling people this. Now, I understand where that data comes from. There was a study that was published in Cell in 2022 that had a lot of people concerned because it had really good feedback, like really good things to consider. You know, for example, it talked about, you know, getting your carbohydrate sources from legumes and lower glycemic carbs, which I'm a fan of. I think that's great. It talked about controlling your fat intake a little bit down to about 30%. I don't fully agree with that. I think it may be closer to 40 or 50 in my humble opinion. And it talked about even doing fasting mimicking type diets like five times a year or three or five times a year, like going through rotations of lower carbohydrate fasting mimicking style protocols. But then there were two things that just seemed totally random. It said that we should be eating as low protein as possible. And then it also said we should completely get rid of red meat. Now, I understand where the red meat discussion comes in too, but with this particular study, they didn't just remove red meat. They removed processed meat too, and they grouped it together, and they said, oh, these people were healthier without red meat. No, I think they were healthier without the processed meat, but they were grouped together. If you remove the processed meat and you left clean, lean, good red meat, probably wouldn't have that issue. The discussion comes in because of this whole methionine discussion. Methionine being a particular amino acid that is known in certain animal models to impact longevity, DNA repair, uh, potential cancer risk. But what we're looking at here is a very obscure singular amino acid versus the entirety of how important protein is. Increasing protein intake without resistance training doesn't really do anything bad, but increasing protein intake along with resistance training definitely increases a lot of benefits. Okay, so you end up with a lot more A, protein synthesis, but you potentially improve longevity, but you definitely improve strength. And strength, as far as all-cause mortality is concerned, is huge. Strength and muscle mass are going to get you through tough times. Not only physical falls and car crashes and things like accidental death, but literally giving you more mass to hold on to if you get, heaven forbid, really, really, really sick like cancer or something like that. So to tell people to not have a reserve 
is very dangerous in my opinion, but it's also, it's just not looking at the entire equation. I think a high protein diet is quite important. And I personally feel that as you get older, you may want to increase your protein because your ability to synthesize it decreases. And I had Dr. Peter Atia on my channel not that long ago. We talked just this directly. Like, and he mentioned that as you get older, like over 40, 50, you might need to start increasing it quite a bit and increase it more and more and more as you get older. It's very, very important, and that is a huge mistake, in my opinion, to be reducing protein so aggressively. I also put a link down below if you like really good quality meat. I put a link for ButcherBox, and that's a special discount link that'll get you their grass-fed, grass-finished beef, or it's not just beef. They also have chicken, they have turkey, they have all kinds of different things. Scallops, they have amazing just selection of like breakfast sausages. And the beef is grass fed and grass finished. Some of the best quality stuff you'll ever have. It tastes amazing. And when you taste their ribeyes or when you taste their fillets, trust me, you're never gonna go back. The price is amazing and it gets delivered right to your doorstep. They've been a sponsor on this channel for a number of years. You know, full disclaimer, they are a sponsor on this channel but I highly, highly, highly recommend you check them out if you just wanna level up your meat game a little bit and get some good quality protein in. So that link is down below in the description. Again, they're grass-fed, grass-finished ground beef. It's game changer. So link is down below. Resveratrol is next. And this one's a little bit more benign because I don't think you're really doing any damage by going out and getting a $15 supplement of resveratrol, except they're not $15 anymore because the longevity game saw, ah, people are interested in these and all of a sudden the prices of this stuff started going up, which is kind of interesting. Now, I don't have anything negative to say. Like, I don't think resveratrol is gonna hurt you, but the strongest data is in fruit flies. So in fruit fly data, they say, oh, okay, well, resveratrol supports the mitochondria and actually increases fruit fly lifespan by 41.4%. And you're talking about a little fly that lives about 70 days as is. So if I go and I get a fruit fly and I decide to feed it kiwis and Oreos and it lives for 90 days instead of 71 days, does that mean that I should tell you that you should only eat kiwis and Oreos because you're gonna live forever? Like this is not the kind of data that we take to the bank. It is the kind of data we start with. So I'm not discounting these kinds of studies. Fruit flies, move to animal models, move to bigger mammals, move to humans, move to observational. Then eventually, retrospectively, you have epidemiological data. So to back up what I'm saying, there's a study published in JAMA that took a look at 783 subjects that were 65 years or older. They looked at the connection between urinary resveratrol and all-cause mortality. So how much resveratrol was in their urine, so how much resveratrol they were taking in, and various instances of disease risk and death. They found that there was zero correlation at all between cardiovascular disease, between inflammation, between cancer, no protection as far as overall, just all-cause mortality was concerned with urinary resveratrol. What that means is that if urinary resveratrol was high, it didn't mean cancer risk was low. It didn't mean cardiovascular disease risk was low. It didn't protect them from all-cause mortality. And the opposite, just because resveratrol was low doesn't mean cancer was high. It, there was just no correlation, nothing connected. But then we have to look at the other side. There was another paper that was published uh, in Molecular Basis of Disease that found that there seemed to be improvement in animal models with resveratrol, particularly if they were metabolically compromised. And this makes sense because the action of resveratrol seems to sort of help support endogenous antioxidants and help support mitochondrial biogenesis. So it helps mitochondria that might be dysfunctional kind of restore and maybe rebuild. So that would make sense if you're metabolically dysfunctional and your mitochondria is damaged. Resveratrol is still good though. I think it's still worthwhile. Like there was another study in molecular nutrition and food research found that there was quite an improvement in oxidized LDL levels, 20% improvement actually in oxidized LDL and a four and a half percent reduction in total LDL when resveratrol was in the mix. And then if you look at some other data, there was a meta-analysis that took a look at six different review papers, found that there was an improvement in essentially blood pressure because there was an increase in nitric oxide levels. So it's definitely not harmful, but the downside is it's not very bioavailable. So it's hard to get really absorbed. So you really should be eating foods that are rich in it and you're getting sort of the side effect of all the other polyphenols and things like that too. And lastly, one's on the chopping block that's gonna upset some people that are very, very just adamant about their cold plunges. I own a cold plunge. I don't mind hopping in that sucker and doing something difficult. I like how it makes my brain feel. I like the effect it has. I feel energized. But to claim that it's gonna make you live longer and it's a good longevity practice, I think is irresponsible. 
And when you look at the data, a lot of it came from this early stuff in 1986 where they looked at rats and they submerged them in relatively cold water for four hours per day, five days a week for 32 months. I dare you, like quit your job and do that full time. And they did see that there was an improvement in some of the markers that are associated with lifespan. But most importantly, they just lost weight and they kind of made that connection. They said, okay, well, they lost weight, lighter bodies are gonna live longer. So a lot of just correlation to correlation to correlation on a rat sitting in cold water for hours. It's not realistic. Then there was a 2023 paper that a lot of people on social media had fun talking about, but it was a fruit fly paper again and they exposed fruit flies to varying temperatures throughout their life. And they found that the cooler the temperature, the longer the fruit fly lived. If you were to take that thought process, there's animals that you can freeze, right? And maybe they like completely hibernate in a frozen form. It means they live longer. I mean, the point is, is that this is not solid enough data. That being said, there's quite a bit of data that suggests that it could be good for the immune system. It could be good for inflammation. But then we have to look at the other side here. If you're doing a cold plunge so much that you're creating a stressful environment for yourself, that's not good. A lot of the people that are doing cold plunges are also people that are working out, are also people that are doing the right things as far as hormetic stressors. And the cold plunge might just be too much. Like for me, I work out hard, I train hard. If I'm gonna cold plunge, it's going to be in lieu of a workout. It's not going to be because of a workout. And we're also putting the cart before the horse once again. One of the most important things for longevity is our muscle mass. And we're starting to see some pretty solid evidence coming out that unfortunately, cold plunging excessively will blunt the hypertrophy effect. And I talked to Alan Aragon about this a little bit because his papers came out in 2023. Pretty solid. I, if you were to work out and then go in a cold plunge, you could have such a reduction in inflammation that you don't get the actual muscle growth effect. So it sounds like I'm bagging on a cold plunge. I think it's a great tool for this. And I think there's some benefit to being able to do tough things and build resiliency, but to use it as a tool to potentially live longer, that's somewhat irresponsible. I don't think that's the case. And until we have further research, that's where I stand and a lot of science stands. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. See you tomorrow.